MRI safety is at the forefront of our profession. It starts with protecting Zone 4 and is why the ACR recommends using a caution barrier at the Zone 4 entrance. But what good is another sign in a room full of signs? Well, Aegis has created the perfect solution with TechGate Auto. TechGate Auto allows more focus on the patient and less worries about someone entering the room without being cleared. If you're serious about MRI safety, use the link in the description below to find out more. Zone 3 Podcast. I am Robert. Yes, and I am Reggie. And we've had Matthew before here. Uh, Matthew Hayes, welcome back. Thank you for coming. You're in town for, I believe, AHRA. I am, yeah. Uh, big things with ScanLab this year at Imaging U as well. Congratulations about that. Thanks. No, we're we're excited. And thanks for letting <laughs> us pull you away from the conference for a few hours just to discuss angiography today. Anything for you dudes. Anything? Right. Yeah. Can I get oh, that in writing? That. Oh, my God. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> do one us- thing for me. I want you to un- undo the bow tie. To prove that it's not a clip-on uh-huh. for the camera, go ahead. Unless you're afraid it, to. It, it is a clip-on, though. It's not. Is okay. it? All right. Uh, no. Okay. Now for the camera, because nobody in this world knows how to. Go ahead, tie one for us. Tie. Make, make sure you're, you're looking at the camera. Right? I can't. With sensual eyes too. Look into the camera. <laughs> Hold on, let me see. We're definitely no, gonna post this as not. how to go. do a bow tie. Hold on, let me put this. It doesn't out. deal well under pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do this. <laughs> Attempt on. number thirty-seven. Cut. Let's see. Okay. There we go. So if you work for the CIA, this is something you learn, I think, the second day, week? Day one. Oh, okay. In my, yeah, in my training, but I'm, I'm old school. Okay. Now, right. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. And you're known as Andy something, I believe, right? It's an undercover name, bro. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Don't give up your spot. <laughs> oh, so, so I can't tell how it necessarily looks. Oh, yeah, because we don't have a, the screen up. Is that good? That is good, actually, yeah. yeah. It's okay, right. I didn't believe it. No, it's. I it's, believe it now. It's, it's incredible. Real. I believe I mean, it now. Yes. Nailed it. That's my. It's my like, my lone trick. My lone, my lone skill set. Uh, what's yours, Reggie? Tying a bow tie. Uh, well, I, I'm I'm a little disappointed at his, his lone skill set because we have him on a podcast to show us how to you know <laughs> work on some MRAs. Well, we have some other oh, no. skill sets in regards no. to like image acquisition and that Not sort of thing. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that was trouble. it. <laughs> well, it's cool because last time so we have what's called the mat cam, and that's that top down. Oh, top down. <laughs> it's that top down. Uh, but no top down today. We got that Surface Pro girl. <laughs> oh, man. You guys are really spoiling me. Uh, you know, we, we tried. It. We heard your comment. <laughs> <laughs> this, this must be how Beyonce feels all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Am I your Jay Z? No. <laughs> Not even close. Why, why you got to make it weird? You're, you're like. <laughs> <laughs> like Dr. Dre? You're special to me. Yeah. But I don't just want to put a label on this. I mean, this early. We don't want to put a title on it? Yeah. Too soon. I get that. All right. I just I want to kind of... Have you been doing okay? I see you've been traveling around Man. Uh, London and... and said, yeah. yeah. You guys have been super, super busy. Oh, yeah. that was all green screen, bro. Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Low budget stuff? Yeah. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> right. The Tower of London. <laughs> yeah, no, it was actually a lot of fun. It was uh, Reggie's, one of his first times in the city to do some sightseeing. Actually, highlight for me was the Cambridge visit, probably. Cool. Yeah, yeah. that was pretty sweet. Mm-hmm. Definitely, if you haven't checked that out, link in, link in the description. Uh, yeah, we had a great time, man. Definitely. Uh, we have to bring you with us next time. Fine. I, I went to university there for a year to study English oh. before my x-ray program started. And I mm-hmm. loved it. it wow. was, I, I, I keep needing to go back. And uh, NHS is one of our clients. So I need to have a need to go over and check on them and nice. had some, you know, double deckers and some monster munch and right. ate, some, ate some pasties. <laughs> and Did it ever throw oh, yeah. you off? <laughs> like, have you been over there since you've been like in the position that you're in now? No. Oh, okay. Because uh, one of the biggest, it's like one of the things that we had struggled with the most is the whole radiographer thing. Oh right? yeah, yeah. Oh, totally. It took totally, me right. t- took me a while, especially if we're doing like early morning demos, because usually if in the UK we're doing something at four or five in the morning oh, for them uh, during lunch, and so add that oh. to calling someone radiographers rather than techs or technologists. Right. But uh, right. Yeah, and and in Germany they call them technicians. So oh. uh, yeah. So. Bang. Anyway. But uh, in, in the States, you call someone a technician and you're, you're going to get shot. Yeah, it's like, 
So. Put it through. Yeah. <laughs> so, but no, it's cool to see you guys doing your thing. Thank you. And, yeah. And rolling around and and uh, I've enjoyed the episodes. Oh, appreciate yeah, it, man. Yeah. Thanks for the shout out. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is going to be a good one because I think a lot of people will enjoy. It's got a lot of uh, things that we haven't covered yet that we we've been meaning to. So. Right. I mean, and geography. That's a pretty big part of MRI. I would oh, say. Oh, for sure. I, I don't know if there's a single location that doesn't perform MRAs, right? It's one yeah. of those statement sequences or, you know, protocols that are run just about, right? Yeah. A lot of texts that seem to, uh, they, they're familiar with carotids and that sort of thing, but when you get into aortas and these sort of things, they get kind of maybe intimidated by it. Um, so we're hoping to kind of help simplify it in terms that maybe it's easier for them to understand today. Mm-hmm. Right. Cool. Yeah, I think there's, 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 you know, these basic, these basic four or five techniques and the, each one of them has their goods and their bads and their pitfalls and 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 a lot of times the the shape of the vessel the the uh, the velocity of the blood um, those kinds of things those are going to determine what sequence is going to work best for for that body part so angio is a little bit counterintuitive in that in that um you know, for instance, 2D. 2D is very limiting in some cases. 2D time of flight, it's very limiting in some cases. But and and other than that, it, it covers a lot it, for your time. You get the most coverage out of 2D time of flight. And we'll go through like the goods and the bads, and um, you know, and just some considerations that you should have. But based off of based off of you know every one of these different types of of, of techniques, there's nothing you can't do. Uh, I think it's also important to talk about some contingency plans that if you if you miss your bolus for some, how, what are you going to do to what what are some sequences you can be able to use to yeah. not have to call that patient back and, and that kind of thing. So we love tips and tricks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Just my opinions. But I mean, um, you're welcome to give them a shot. I, I always say that if any of my classes or anything, don't just take what I say as like canon, go and prove it right or prove it wrong. Right. Because uh, I, I think it's important to make your own way in MRI, to do your own experiments, to take time on yourself to improve yourself and not just take people's word for it. Because sometimes people will tell you things, hey, this is this is canon, and you do it, and it's not necessarily true. It might be their own experience or their own magnet or, you know, some kind of, it, it's just important for you to try everything I'm saying for yourself. Right. So Basically apply what you've learned. Pretty much. Yeah. I like yep. it for yep. sure. So, and that, that, that's the way I always do things. I've got maybe four or five people that I will take everything they say as, okay, cool. But I still, I'm still going to try it. Um, I'm still going to try it, but, right. but still at the same time, some people don't know what they don't know and they're not trying to mislead you. It's just, I try to confirm what, what I've been taught. Right. Yeah. No, for sure. I like that. Yeah. So to help, people understand this better what would you say was the first thing that we should kind of dive into like what's the intro to Uh, um so i i thought we should start out with something a lot of us do um a lot which is which is you know circle of willis 3d time of flight oh especially with the ct contrast shortage man we've seen an uptake in a bunch of those cases for sure i think that's going to be good for a lot of things i think a lot of people have been holding on to to ctas uh while mri gets steadily and steadily better and a lot of this is just out of habit and so um now now something important for everybody to understand is that ct you do not pay a time penalty for spatial resolution you don't get it and you get it for free dang all right so so ct will has like an insane resolution uh like like 2000 by 2000, you know, we're, we're fighting for 220, 256 by 224, you know what I mean? <laughs> right, yeah. But you do not pay a time penalty. So CT can actually visualize, uh, because of its ultra high resolution, it can visualize the, the walls, um, it can visualize the, m- in much greater detail. Right. But obviously there's, there's drawbacks to CT contrast. I mean, you're injecting maple syrup into someone right. at six cc's per second. Right. So, but, uh, but Man, I can uh, go for some maple syrup right now. <laughs> you hungry again? <laughs> <laughs> you just ate. <laughs> um, no, but, 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 uh, CT, CT is crazy. It's really good. Uh, I'm a CT tech as well. Um, and, and it's just every, everything has its place, but I do right. know in MR these days, we can do a really good job 
especially if we know the different techniques and when to use them to really help throughout this this shortage. Sweet. Yeah. Sweet. So we think about starting with maybe uh, just yeah. 3D time of flight yeah, or just 3D. time of flight in general? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, time of flight is everybody knows time of flight is a non-contrast technique. Right. And to be able to be bright on on a on a time of flight, you have to be present or the proton has to be present, has to be excited and it has to be present in the slice that we care about at the time of readout. So that is the two prerequisites uh, that have to be that have to be taken into consideration for time of flight. For sure. Okay. For sure. Um, we're putting in RF into the, uh, the 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 background tissue faster than it can get rid of it, so it becomes saturated. So that's the reason um, n new new inflowing um, new inflowing blood is bright because it hasn't had time to be saturated, but we'll cover that. Um, but um, the tissue, the static tissue that's holding still, it's receiving, we're giving it RF faster than it can get rid of it. And so it starts to become saturated. It just gets right. darker and darker and darker. We want really dark background tissue and we want really, really bright inflowing protons. So people who aren't having that really dark background, is, is it because their T is just too high? Do they need to just kind of bring that down a notch or? Um, that's, that's something you could do. Um, you'll, there's, there's um, um, mag transfer that you can put on oh, yeah, yeah, to yeah. be able to, to add uh, another, uh, like an off resonant uh, pulse that, that, that saturates um, macromolecules as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, at three T, you'll notice you don't have to do anything like that because the recovery is so it takes so long mm -hmm. that you have more background recovery. Because remember, at three T, hey, check me out, I'm back. <laughs> at three T, it takes much longer for the recovery of that static tissue. Right. And so when we're giving RF to it at a really fast rate, we get better background suppression. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, let's start out with let's start out with three D time of flight, and just a couple of uh, of just kind of how it works, and then uh, some tricks that I use to be able to improve it. Okay, so you'll see here that we have um, these different these different slabs. Maybe you've noticed um, slab, 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 slob. That's me. Um, <laughs> there we go. So in this case, we have an overall volume that you're seeing, and we have four different slabs in this case, and so. Remember, the, the prerequisite for something being bright on, on a time of flight is that it has to be, the proton has to be excited right. and then it has to be read out. It has to be present in that slice that you care about. And so in the, sla in the 3D time of flight, we're, 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 what we're going to do is we're going to actually, we're going to excite and it's going to be slab specific. So only this slab is going to be receiving the RF to be able to become excited. Now, when you say excited, are, are the, the protons that are excited are the ones that are in phase? No, no, just, just, just protons inside of just receiving the 90. Okay. I see. So they're the ones we're focusing on. Yeah. So yeah, the, the so we're, we're doing a, a, a slab selective excitation pulse, which is really good because we've got all these yummy protons and they're, they're moving this way, right? So the idea is we want a really, really, um, we want a really short TE. Right. So typically in, inside of these gradient echo um, 3D sequences, we want a short TR and a short TE. The longer the TE you have, um, the greater chance you're giving the blood to actually leave, right? The dip, the, cause there's going to be time between the excitation pulse and the readout. Right. And that's that time of flight. Uh, you know, we're giving it time to actually um, new new protons to come in and enter, old protons to be leaving. But the idea here is that we we want to keep these really bright and fresh, and we want to keep this background nice and dark. Okay, so um, so yeah, so all we're doing in this case is we are doing one slab at a time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the good news about 3D time of flight is that it really holds up well from tortuous vessels. And uh, by tortuous vessels, I mean, you know, just going all over the place, all the curves. not not specifically straight in line. Right. So that's what we really like about 3D time of flight. We don't like it because it 
we don't have nearly the coverage inside of time of flight for for the time. For the time, yeah. Um, and um, also we have a problem inside of here. You guys have ever seen Venetian blind artifact? Oh yeah. Okay, inside inside of inside of your vessels. Right. And what's happening there? So it's just kind of like where the vessels kind of aren't as bright as the other the rest of it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Do you know why that is? Is this a, a saturation thing? Absolutely, right. yeah. So you see here, uh, in, inside of this slab number one, my, my blood is going to be in that slab a very small amount of time. Slab two, though, I'm going to be in this. Uh, my, my blood's going all the way through here. So it's going to be receiving more RF. And so you'll see right here, it'll be really bright because that's nice and fresh. But by the time it's gotten up here, you see a drop off. And then you see a really bright signal on this side. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah and, for sure. And so, and so, so here's bright, Did here's heart, dark. Right before you yeah. it. And so that's, that's really that, that's where that Venetian blind artifact comes from. Oh. And so typically you can do two things. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm a big proponent of, of this one instead. Sorry. Hey, by the way, this is terrific. So, so let's say for instance, in this case, we are going to do four slabs to cover 100 uh, millimeters of tissue, okay? Um, I can instead, instead of doing this uh, four slabs, I can do five or six and each one of them are smaller. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. So instead of there being four large slabs, now there is, you know what I mean? Yeah. Now there are five or six, let's do like this. And so that way, less time, if you're doing this, there's less, less time that it's going to take to actually saturate. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? For sure. And so that's a quick and easy way. And you're still covering 100 millimeters. You're just, you're actually reducing the number of slices inside of these, but you're increasing the number of slabs. Now, how, how, how are we preventing like venous flow coming in? Ah, yeah, yeah because, um, Above the sat, uh, above the slabs, we are putting uh, sat bands, and so in this case, it, we are having venous that's coming down, but that that inversion, you know, that 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 spatial inversion sat band is making it to where those protons are, those fr protons that are flowing in are are saturated. saturated. Oh, nice. Yeah. So if we wanted to see the venous and get rid of the arterial, would just switch that switch. Bop, bop. Yeah. Now, now the, art, the, the Venus we'll talk about, that's really good to be able to use in 2D time of flight. Oh. So, but, but, oh, nice. but you're saying, are, 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 um, if, you, if you did want to use a, a 3D technique and you wanted Venus instead, you just swap the sat bands and now you just put it down inferior. So all arterial sat, uh, arterial blood that's flowing in is saturated and all of this Venus blood flow is not and it's flowing back down. Cool. Yeah. Nice, man. So um, there's another method that you can do, but not all vendors have this. Um, it's called tone, the tone ramp. Oh. And so the idea here is Robert's that- Robert's got a good tone. Thank you. Can, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so what, what they do across this, what they do across this, this um, individual slab is they change the flip angle. So maybe you start out with a 20 degree flip angle here, and then an 18, and then a 17, 16, and 15. So as the blood is actually flowing up here, it we give it less of a flip angle, less RF. So there's less of uh, a saturation effect right. by the time we excite that next slab. Well, yeah. And, and typically when you're going to want to use either one of these techniques, either adding more or doing the tone to be able mm -hmm. to adjust the flip angle here is when the patient has slow flow. Oh, so okay. if the patient is a young kid or doesn't have any kind of you know, issues or whatever, right. um, you, you probably don't need that tone ramp. You don't need to change the, because the, the, the blood is literally flowing so fast that it doesn't have time to become saturated. We're missing that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And so that's the idea of, of, um, a 3d. So once again, the 3d time of flight, it takes a long time in regard to, um, you know, just the overall coverage that you want, but it's really, really great for high detail, and um, tortuous and tortuous vessels. Nice. And it's just because we're really imaging 
the whole volume, right? Like in three dimensions, like it's literally a 3D sequence. That's why it's a 3D time of flight. Yeah, they, and they're talking, uh, well, you're, you're adding up all those individual um, slabs mm -hmm. to be able to, um, yeah, to, to be able to um, be a 3D volume. And every right. single one of these slices themselves have a negative gap. Oh, yeah, so you're, right. you're, you're really, and, and so, so are the slabs. So they have a negative gap, so there's always a lot of, of you know, overlap. And that's another reason why it takes longer, because right. you need that you need that overlap. Need that overlap right? Yeah. So, oh, so the overlap something that we could increase or decrease to help with Phoenician blind? Um, Would you go down? I mean, the more overlap up? that you've got, the better. But the okay. more overlap you've got, the longer it's going to take you. Okay. Uh, because you're going to have to reacquire a lot of a lot of places that. I mean, you're you're doing you're sadding, right? double the work. Right. So yeah, it's not a bad idea though. What is the recommended amount of slabs? What, what have you done in the past, I guess? Uh, for the Circle of Willis? Yeah. I like to do, because I think at, uh, some, at some of the vendor's trees mm -hmm. or whatever, it comes out at like three or four. Right. That's what I'm familiar with, uh, too. Okay. Typically, th I, think, I think three. Okay. But I, I, I like to, um, in that case, I like to do four or five, four or, uh, or, or five or six with, with, smaller, with smaller actual individual slabs. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. So this is, all right, I'm getting it. I'm getting the hang. It's better homogeneity. Um, it's just like it's, when it comes to the intensity of the vessel, the more slabs technically. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, and, and, and like I said, um, the, the, the faster the flow, the less problems you're going to have to, ah. you're less, you're going to have to uh, work with this stuff. So I, I would, I would typically recommend for, I'd say five just out of the gate. And if you have someone with really slow flow, Right. This is just a way for you to repeat that, but be able to, you know, make your make your slabs smaller or change that flip angle. So I think of it as a kind of a reactive uh, oh, technique. For sure. So got to repeat or something. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Nice. There's there's a new um, like on Siemens. There's a new technique that they're using. It's called segments. Oh. And so typically, what the TR is, is for a time of flight so far, mm -hmm. it is a the time that it takes for, let me think about this, between inversions. That's how, so when you do the inversion, because remember this is gonna be over my, my brain here. Oh, whole sequence time, baby. My brain, oh God. <laughs> anyway, uh, the time between the sat band, because remember we're, we're gonna put a sat band up here, right? And all of our, <clears throat> just gets worse, doesn't it? Snowball effect. Anyway, the, the TR oh, really is defined as the distance between the inversion and the cheeseburger. And the other inversion. So two inversions together. But so some of the something new. I know this is terrible. Oh gosh. I, I always do this. I'm gonna sign this one. Beautiful. Um, and YouTube so, is gonna ban us. I don't know what that is. It's um it's genital. It's not important. But uh, what you can start to do now is you do because right now it's gonna be inversion readout, inversion readout, inversion readout. But now you can start to do inversion and read out, read out, read out. So you can uh -huh. do three, two or three readouts. That's something new on, on. So you're kind of packing that in tighter so you can get it. Yeah, so I said read out, read out, read out instead. And so it's gonna, it's gonna, it'll tell you that your TR is longer, but that's okay. Right. Now, the, the, what you're worried about here is Venus signal starting to ease in there, uh, ease in there and, and not be so dark but it works really well. For instance, I mean, for me, time of flight 3Ds in my mind take five minutes, five and a half minutes or whatever. Right. But uh, with, with these, this segments that you now have, mm -hmm. it's taken me three and a half minutes. So oh, it's just like, nice. it's, it's just free money. Wow. So if you have- uh, No compressed sensing, none mm -hmm. of that extra stuff, huh? I, I, I'm, I'm still on the fence when it comes to compressed sensing, uh, when it, especially because it's, it's, it's really guessing at a lot of data. And when it comes to, um, when it comes to really high resolution vessels, right. I think you just need to be very, very mindful of your compressed sensing factor uh, or oh, sensing sure. factor, just to make sure that it's not the, the, that iterative reconstruction is not guessing Over. too much. Yeah. You want to still give it a core amount of data. So 2d time of flight has its goods and its bads as well. So, uh, the good, the good thing about uh, 2d time of flight is that it covers a large amount of Oh, right. Vessels. Of, of area. Area. Okay. For sure. The, the bad thing, what? The bad thing about 2D time of flight 
is that um, it's very sensitive to what we call in-plane flow. Oh yeah. So there we go. Uh, so so what you so let's say when whenever. So let's say I'm doing because you know two D time of flight is just going to be one at a time. The 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 individual individual slices are you know overlapped as well. Yes, but they they're not doing like a slab selective excitation or anything like that. It's just, right. It's one slice, one slice, one slice, one slice. So. Uh, but it's filling the whole the whole case space at once. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 It's a it's a it's a single shot. Yeah. Read out. I believe. I mean, I'm right. sure it could be more, but but yeah, for the most part. Right. So so it it does really really great really great work when the vessel that we care about is perpendicular to the slices that we're getting. And so that's the reason why you lose the subclavian arteries, right? If you're right. doing a straight Good axial, up. you're going to come down and right when my slice is parallel here, that, 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 that blood flow is parallel to the actual slice that we're doing. Right. You're getting that saturation. What causes the stair steppy looking artifact that you can kind of get from uh, doing karate? You know how it kind of looks like it's on doing the 2D. Yeah. yeah, on what the 2Ds. The, <laughs> yeah. I feel like I'm in a Vogue. Yeah, <laughs> my goodness. Um, it's just it's it's a lack of the it's it, it's the technique and a lack of uh, as much superimposition. It can oh. also be a result of of you know, we're typically wanting to do the 2D time of flight as a contingency plan. Um, uh, for the carotids, if we can't, if we're doing it non-contrast, right? Right. Um, and there's a lot of different, uh, different flow patterns inside the 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 carotids. Mm -hmm. A lot of different changes in the in the diameter of the vessel, and so you can see. I mean, same thing with motion. The patient, we we like it a little bit because the you're not waiting the entire time to see if the patient moved or not. It's you're you're getting one at a time, so you kind of are getting what you're getting. But just because the technique, you're going to have a little bit more. Um, you can see differences because of flow velocities, because of patient motion, that motion, kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, something, something that. So uh, technically, like the vessel might be here when you do that one slice, and then they might move slightly. Yeah, exactly. And it's there, and then now, now you look like you're doing my Vogue thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah I'm, <laughs> see, I'm glad you were with me on yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, no, I, I, sure. So now, we repeat that. Now I understand too. how people always know the dance moves in movies. They just, <laughs> I get it. I get it. Um, so something that people get really wrong. Imaging Diversified is staffed with managers, directors, technologists, and application specialists that can relate to our colleagues' everyday issues. We look to enhance the quality of work by sharing our expertise. Schedule a specialist today. When, when, when we're really trying to do this is when we're doing a, I'm just doing kind of a, a, a top-down kind of thing, um, for our superior sagittal sinus, dumping down into our jugulars. Right for for MRVs. Right. So full full brain MRVs. So if I were to go straight ahead, the superior sagittal sinus is going to look awesome. But when I get to the back right here, I'm going to have that in plane flow, that in plane oh, saturation. Yeah. And so a lot of times what people will do is they will instead of on a 2D brain, what you really should be doing is like triple obliquing it. So you're making it to where no no vessel is perfect, but also no vessel sucks. Dang, interesting. So see, so ideally, so on if I'm looking straight down, I would want my I would want my images, my my slices to maybe be like this, and that way I get pretty good superior sagittal sinus, pretty good everything else. Now now I would have a problem, right. I don't know. Yeah, it's really Somewhere like right, right here. Uh, yeah. Right here would be, a, and right here would be, a, but I'm going to triple oblique it. So if I'm also looking straight ahead. Oh, your coronal. Yeah. Because I'm looking, yeah, if I'm looking at the coronal, um, I'm also going to oblique those slices. Nice. Same thing. So I want to triple oblique it. I want to make it look really, really gross like I have. Right. Uh, <laughs> to, to, to make it to where no, uh, there is no complete saturation of of a, a certain vessel that's running parallel to the slice because there should be no vessel that could possibly run parallel to all three obliques. I see. Nice. Now people can get around that a couple of ways. They can do, uh, sometimes people do a pre and a post. Oh. So uh, the contrast will help limit the, um, the saturation as well. Mm -hmm. Or they could do two 
pre or two non contrasts at 90 degree angles from themselves. And so you'll see on our first one, we had this one that was a problem. On this next one, we've got this one that's a problem. And so you, you can know the your radiologist can, yeah, they can compare and know that that's an artifact. It is not consistent across both sets of, of images. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So now what I've got to figure out to do, how to, how to de delete oh, this fast. Best way, you see that little dotted rope? Uh -huh. If you click that and then select it all, so you see at the top where your tools are, then just make a big circle around everything, and then you should be oh. able to. What? You kids and your technology. Uh, oh. Yeah. OK, I got it. I got yeah. it. I'm going to get it. And then you can just. And I just delete it? Trash can? Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you, Reggie. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm here for. My goodness. Um, but um, something something else. Um, so so 2D time of flight would not be good for for a circle of Willis because of the tortuosity of the vessels. Right. Right? Right. Um, 3D time of flight wouldn't be great for the carotids because the carotids are so long, the patient would die of old age <laughs> while we, while we got, um, you know, while we, while we were fixing this. Right. So that's, that's the, that's the key there. Um, sometimes, like I said, people will do uh, 2D, 2D time of flights just through the bifurcation. Right. Because I want to say it's like, it's like 85% of the patient's pathology in the vessel, I mean, in the carotid, will be at the level of the bifurcation. Right, right, bifurcation, right? Yeah. Right. Um, something I didn't mention as well is that the time of flight, you will always, you will always overcall stenosis. So time of flight is not going to be good for areas that could be stenotic. Oh. So think about that. A lot of times we're not looking for, we're looking for aneurysm inside the brain. So 3D time of flight's completely fine with that. Right. So if you look at the vessel, uh-oh, uh-huh, got it. So if I'm looking at this vessel, right, and it has a stenosis, um, the dephasing, because the, the blood's going to come through and everything's going fine coming up. But as soon as it goes through the stricture, if you've ever seen like a creek or something and, and right. you, you dam it up on either side, you get that. Um, that like, vortex flow. Yeah. And so really you would see that, that that stenosis is only this big, but on the actual image you would see bright, bright, and then all of this would just be dark because of the, you'd, you'd have lost signal due to dephasing. I see. And so you'll always overcall the, the amount, uh, the, 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 the degree of stenosis because of the time of flight sequence. And just, so that's pretty much why still the best standard of practice when it comes to gadding the carotids, huh? That's right. I see. Because in, in terms of, so time of flight uses the, uses time of flight methodology and also um, the protons not being too out of phase right. to be able to, that, that's, the, that's the basis of the sequence. Whereas contrast enhanced uses just T1 shortening. Right. And, and, activity, and, right? Yeah, and so it doesn't matter. The, that's that's the reason why an MRI, the gold standard for for stenosis, is going to be um, contrast enhanced angiography. Right. Yeah. So let me show you this, Reggie. Yes. Oh, wait. See? Okay. Do you not often see stenosis up in the circle of Willis, and that's why typically you wouldn't do contrast enhance? Uh, well, uh, in the circle of Willis, there's typically not a ton of stenosis. I mean, uh, it's. Well, I mean, if we did have some stenosis, how would that brownie in motion be looking? You know what I'm saying? We talked about that in that last episode, too. Check the link out in the description. That's three for three for me. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> so there was a joke that we had last time oh, gosh. that we were here, and we were talking about diffusion, and we were talking about brownie in motion. And and I also said that's it's very ironic because that's also Reggie's um, stage name? Exotic dancer name. <laughs> <laughs> Brown, Brownie in motion. Next to the stage. Go ahead. Say, let's hear your DJ so, voice. So, <laughs> welcome to stage. Put, put your hands together for a Brownie in motion. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, all the ladies cheer. Yep. Uh, anyway, so that we have to ladies. mention that. Oh, never mind. <laughs> um, but so, so contrast enhanced. <laughs> I'm happy we worked that in. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, give give the people what they want, right. and by the people, Why I mean the here. people in this room. <laughs> right. That's what I always say. Who cares about your your target audience? As long as we're happy, fine. Um, so uh, 
contrast enhanced MRA is is or, or sorry any more questions on 2d versus 3d well so because of that saturation artifact, artifact is that the reason why on the 2ds you don't go all the way down to the arch yeah there's for a carotid um also because of i mean the the farther the the it doesn't do well with with um high velocity either turbulent flow right? yeah turbulent flow yeah, yeah. you got to think about all the changes which is what stenosis causes right yeah, oh, e yeah. exactly that's, that's a great point so yeah. um the the part of the body that has the highest pressure is the aorta and so mm -hmm. and you got to think there's two things that will cause um there's two things that will cause vortex flow or, or disrupted flow mm -hmm. it, it is it is either a stenosis or it's a large vessel becoming a small vessel very quickly which is technically oh, like spasm like a no no, no, no. I mean, think about you have your you have your huge aorta, and it's giving way to the carotids and the brachiocephalic, and so uh, the amount of blood trying to get up over for something that's large to something that's small, right. you have a lot of disruptions in, in terms of, of flow velocities. I see. And so, yeah, that's a great, great point. I'm happy that you brought that up. I was going to forget about that kind of thing, <laughs> but, but you'll see that um, we love the 2Ds um, inside the carotids if we can't get a vessel or the patient has too low EGFR or something, we, we get our good stuff at the top. And we you notice we don't see the, the vertebral artery in the back too often because it's tortuous. Right. If you ever look, notice the, and you do a contrast enhanced MRA carotid, you'll see the, you'll see the uh, vertebral arteries. But what we're really focused on is the, is the carotids. And the good news is, is we can get pretty good images around the bifurcation, which is most likely the issue uh, right. and if, if there is stenosis anyway. Well, and one thing that I'm kind of taking away from this too is that if you have one of those scanners where you can do the segments, then maybe you can just forget your 2D and go straight 3D because you're going to save some time, right? I haven't tried it yet. That's 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 super cool to think about. Right. I'll try that this week. Definitely want to check that out. Yeah. 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 So um, but there's, and I'm not trying to be um, super critical of compressed sensing either or, or right. sensing or. Well, I think uh, anyone who has tried it, they, they can understand, they can relate with the same situation because I, I have seen similar experiences that you've had too with it. Yeah. No, and, and especially in the, in the brain, as you go up in your compressed sensing factor or your acceleration factor, you start to lose small vessel detail. And I don't know about you, but if I'm looking at an MRA, I kind of care about small vessel detail. All right. So it, it's, sure. I think, I think too many people just thought compressed sensing, um, uh, is the answer. That's what I'm just going to use for everything. It's going to make my life so much easier. It's, it's a balance, just like anything in MR is. It's, it's a balance between I always try to, to use something, take it up until it breaks, and then take it back down to where it's a compromise between time savings and image quality. Well, not to get into compressed sensing too much, but uh, it, I know compressed sensing technically has been around for a while, right? The technique itself even though it's kind of now just kind of being utilized um, it's, just because of where we're at. It's right? been utilized in, in television and digi right. digital radio, radio uh, like for, for years. Right. Yeah. Um, MR wise, do you think it's going to get better? Like, is this just first generation that we're seeing? So, you know, yeah. every generation kind of improves, it, improves, improves. It'll get better. And I hate to cop out um, and just say AI because that's what anybody can do to get out of any conversation that's <laughs> difficult these days. Oh, God. <laughs> it's like AI. It's like a. Yeah, really. Like my daughter was like, "Hey, how are babies made?" And I was like, "AI." And I just I, I ran out of the room. Same, same thing for same thing for I mean anything with MR wise, right? I mean like, oh oh man, it's really tough to angle this knee. Don't worry, AI hey. is coming. <laughs> I don't know when and I don't know how, but right. the Terminator is going to angle all of this for you. So, but I, nice. it's I think I think there will be first and second iterations uh there's some new um some new like a wave kyperenia that's come out that really allows you to fill case space in a really really cool way right. where you don't have to you, you're getting that true data um it's hard for me to keep up with all these new things with right. with but but there's always something new there's always a way to take something that's that's worked in other areas and apply that to mr for sure wave kyperenia I, I think we're utilizing that with SWIs? Yeah, that's right. Oh my gosh. It's like a corkscrew through K-Space in 3D. It's crazy. The noise yeah. it makes is crazy. Yeah, I know. 
Yeah, it's, it's kind of messed me up. It's at like first. The, it's like the MRI version of a Creed song. Right. Yeah, you, just, <laughs> you, 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 you want it to be over right. as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah. This oh. is how you. Oh God. <laughs> uh, um, um, but yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Contrast all right. enhanced. Right. Contrast enhanced uh, MRA is is something that we got to keep in, in in mind here is is it's you know all about the timing but it's also how you're filling case space and there's this factor uh, called time to center and it's super important remember in inside of inside of case space the center of case space is in, in, in control of your contrast the periphery of case space those your high frequency signals those are in charge of your detail okay so in this case, if I, and these are the older scanners, they will scan like this. Um, it led to a lot of like, it's, it wasn't very scientific. You say, hey, I don't know why, but as soon as I see the, the lungs blush, if I hit start, then it always gives me the, a really Aww. good um, filling of the carotids. And that's because you were filling all the way down like this. You were just filling Cartesian in a linear fashion. And so the idea is that by the time, this would be your time to center in this case, from here down to here, however long it took you to fill in your time to center of seven seconds. So you're trying to hit the time of center at that point exactly when that person's, that, the, the contrast is coming up and filling the actual vessel. At the brightest, right? Yeah, so it's not, not very scientific, especially when the patient has various different cardiac outputs and, uh, and and that kind of thing. For sure. So you you want to minimize your time to center. And so you have some of these newer, you have some of these newer techniques and it's called elliptico-centric case space filling. Okay, so instead of, instead of filling from, from outer to inner, it starts out and it kind of, it starts out down, it comes down to the middle and that's your time of center and then it goes back and it fills the rest dot by dot um, all the way out. And the cool thing about this, so if this is the case, your time to center, you start here, you end here. So it's like one second time to center. Right. If you're gonna do it that way though, you have to hit the bolus. So if you're doing a care bolus or a, a fluoro trigger, you're going to have to wait for the, in this case, for the carotid to already be fully opacified before or very close yeah. to be fully opacified before you hit go. For sure. Because if, if you're if you're using your old school timing of when the lungs blush, I've already filled the center of K space oh. way before the contrast actually entered the carotids. For sure. So if you have a long time to center, you gotta start that scan to hopefully meet the the you're filling the center of K space when that carotid is filled with contrast. Make sense? For sure. So this is a lot better, this elliptico-centric or 3D-centric reordering, depending on what um, what vendor that you've got. If you were, if, say you had extended coverage, right? Maybe, I don't know, aorta or something. Maybe we can do carotid still. Or is it, would you still use elliptical? Oh, yeah. Still, right? But I would still, okay, so if you think about it, um, I, would, I would start to think about, um, I would think about uh, having my bolus last longer. So okay. if, if I'm going to do so, oh, so for, right? yeah, for for a carotid, I'm mm -hmm. trying to get the candy cane, right? Oh, yeah. So I need to wait. If I hit it here, if, I, if I'm waiting for it to be bright here, mm -hmm. um, that's going to give me a, a lot of trouble. Because then here, because I've already filled the center of case space really quickly, this is going to be dark. So what I would like to do, I'm doing two cc's a second. Maybe instead I do 1.5 cc's a second and it lasts. And I've wondered that before. I'm like, why don't we decrease the injection rate to open the window of opportunity? In this case, that would make total sense because I need to make sure, <laughs> I need to make sure that, um, that hey. the entire thing is opacified uh, before. And, and, you know, you obviously having the patient take in a breath and hold it when the, when the oh, vessel... Yeah because you want to have them holding their breath and have the complete thing opacified before you're getting go. Sure. So, and um, the importance of the breath hold is pretty much the accuracy, right? Like uh, of uh, the positioning. Yeah, it's what's well, it's in it's, the importance of the breath hold for uh, for a 
thoracic aorta for a renal artery is it, oh, just it's motion. motion. Right. Okay. Um, and 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 that's the thing about the about the the renals. That's the thing about the um, anything in the abdomen is that you're the amount of information that you can gather inside of that 3D K space is going to be contingent on how long that patient can actually hold their breath. Right. But for the carotid, I don't breath hold for carotids. Right. Um, do you guys? It's it's kind of. No. The habit. There's not. You and might wow. have some motion down in the aorta. Right. But if you think about it, <laughs> you know what I mean. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, so so okay. Um, so this is this is super super cool, and I would recommend anybody that wants to get good at contrast enhanced angiography, just add an extra sequence in if you have a, a, a cervical spine with and without. Oh. It's not costing you anything. Okay. You're still going to inject. You can still play around, and it doesn't cost you anything. You're right, because you're still giving contrast. You're still giving contrast. I mean, it costs you an injector set, maybe. Or, right. or, you know. But uh, I, I think it's a really good way to, to break those eggs, make those omelets. When there's no pressure. Yeah. So, But try this. Uh, if you don't have ScanLab, technically. That's true. <laughs> um, See that episode in the description as well. <laughs> um, so in this case, when we're filling case space ellipticocentrically, mm -hmm. Um, and like I said, use this on a patient that you don't need this because you're never going to do this in real life until you've done it a couple times yourself. Get, ask me how long my carotid um, sequence is. Hey, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> ring, ring. Hello. <laughs> hey, uh, how long is your carotid 45 se seconds. Uh, nice. Now, everybody, when I say 45 seconds, exactly, Katie's like, you're going to get some kind of venous contamination, right? Because you're going to, but you won't. Because Are you waiting for the first 20 seconds? <laughs> no, no, you're waiting for the carotid to be completely opacified. And then you hit go. And if you think about it, you are filling the center of case space while you're still an arterial. And then you're going back out. Now, right here, contrast is starting to dump from the jugulars but it's okay because we've already filled the area of case space that's in charge of contrast. So all we do for the rest of the time, sure, this stuff is filled with venous, but it doesn't even contribute to contrast. And so we have super, super high resolution 3D contrast MRAs for still free. With a pretty good temporal resolution still too, right? Oh, but we're not talking. We don't, we don't care at this point. You're right. Yeah. No, I mean, we, we just have to make it. It's perfect in this situation because right. the patient doesn't have to hold their breath. And I mean, that's pretty much the reason. So for it, people out there wondering if they're, which type of MRA they're using contrast in how do you, how do you tell if it's uh, centric or not pretty much um, feeling? It, they, they sh there will be a, a button or it'll, it'll say, It'll well, one of three, it, it'll say linear. Linear is where we're just top to bottom. Mm -hmm. Centric is actually just basic centric is where we start in the middle, and we're still filling Cartesian. So out of the tree when you pull this up, then usually it's going to be. So you're you're linear. you're you're referring to Siemens. Oh yeah, I guess I, we are heavy Siemens based. So yeah. Um, yeah, if you're pulling something out of the Siemens tree these days, uh, 3D centric reordering will already be on, and that's what forward. causes you to have uh, an opportunity for a low time to center. Time to nice. If you were to go back and turn that off, you'll notice that your time to center jumps up immediately to like four or five, six seconds, because now you're starting to fill linear again from top to bottom. For sure. For yeah. sure. Um, but try that. Uh, let us know in the comments if that works for you. It's going to work. Right. You can really, you can, uh, and you can really increase your, your spatial resolution big time and not have to worry about venous contamination. Is background suppression still as important when we're talking relaxivity, I guess, and contrast? I mean, you, what you're doing, when you're doing contrast enhanced, you're getting your background suppression by subtraction. Oh, oh yeah, do that. And you're also That's getting right. rid of, you'll notice inside of carotids, you'll notice that um, your, typically it's your transverse sinus. Your transverse sinus will be bright on both. Right. But I it'll be bright that not because it's enhanced it'll be bright because of that in plane it, it was just like i said so it was right present at the right time yes yeah, short tr short tes you got that excitation mm -hmm. and then you you are you're there for the readout right but the cool thing is is when we do a subtraction if it's bright on the pre bright on the post subtraction it'll be gone it's like it's almost like 
that friend that came to a party that you didn't really invite him to? You're like, how'd you get to this party? So, so, but you, so what do you do? So you just attract them, right? Yeah, right, absolutely. Right. Yeah. That was probably top 10 analogies. You know what I'm my, saying? I've been working life. on those. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's how we get our background suppression there is because we, if you notice on your time of flight, uh, even with contrast, or right. sorry, your, your contrast enhanced MRA. Um, so that's typically like a 3D turbo flash or a really fast GRE. Mm -hmm. um, we, we subtract the two of those, and that's the only thing that's different between the pre and the post is vessels that are bright. Vessels that are bright. And that is working out of the premise of T1, uh, T1 shortening. For sure. Well, I know one thing that's kind of been uh, on the up and up. And uh, some places still feel uncomfortable utilizing it because of the temporal resolution. But of course, time resolved, right? Because it, it, it eliminates missing your arterial phase. What do you mean? Uh, so like twist or uh, what are some of the other names? Uh, tricks. tricks. tricks and, um, I don't know what Phillips is. Yeah, treats. I think there treats. was. They used to kind of mess with each other. That's funny. Yeah, I they, like that. They used to, that they, might be my new favorite. They used to play off. Uh, Tricks and treats, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it changed a little bit. I think it, I think, I think it, it's changed more recently. But yeah, I, I think the first iteration, or at least one of the work in progress, was called treats. Treats, little nice. Little, I like that. little jab. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, okay. Um, so, so you you like the tricks technique? Uh, I so I, I think it's 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 easier to get consistency with tricks. Okay. Uh, w w when are you typically using it? Are you using it for everyone? So we currently, our radiologists are not fond of it uh, simply because of the, you, you have for, to get a good temper resolution, you have to give up something, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to give up spatial resolution usually. Um, mm -hmm. And they prefer spatial over temporal. So we are still doing the traditional um, like flash. Cardiac is where I usually see it. But uh, yeah, cardiacs? we do do some cardiacs okay. that do tricks. Yeah, I, I used aorta. To, I used to use it in deep vein thrombosis studies. Um, uh, so before tricks came along or treats or whatever, uh, I would I would actually obviously with a radiologist's permission, I would um, I would take the patient's legs and I would put uh, tourniquets around their legs, mid thigh, right above the knee, below the knee, mid calf. Right. And what that's going to do is force the contrast into the deep veins away from the peripheral um, vasculature. Okay, that's an old X-ray thing. Did you come up with that? I was going to say. Okay. No, that's no, no, no. I mean, never um, heard of that. But I would start the haze technique. I would, I would start yeah. modified haze. Well, modified problem. haze. <laughs> um, uh, but I would, I would start an IV in every both foot, both Ooh. feet, and then I would inject and. And somebody with a history of thrombosis, deep vein thrombosis, Listen, you would start an IV I, in I, their I, foot. <laughs> They got to walk it out afterwards. Uh, again, this was this was my rad. That I mean, we yeah. But but um, that's great. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> DVTs, no problem. If you don't have them now, you no no. So we we never had a problem to be honest. That's awesome. Um, uh, but we we did follow up with anticoagulants and things like that. Oh, um, sure. And usually the patient was already on anticoagulants at the time if they were suspected uh, DVT. But but. Um, that's what I did before that, because it, otherwise it was really impossible, very hard to have a solid bolus and watch it come back in uh, oh. venous wise. Um, but with with tricks, with twists, with whatever, uh, you're able to have just you're, you're, you're getting a, you can have 50 measurements and you are getting a new 3D every, you know, five, six, ten, seven, whatever seconds that you decide. Right. But it's, I, I find that not a lot of people really understand that the, the twist technique. Right. Uh, it's, it's complicated. It, it's modified keyhole is what it's called. Uh, there's the keyhole filling method as well. We can talk about, we can talk about both because there is something called the temporal footprint that no one knows. I, I thought that a long time ago, I thought that the twist sequence was like a black box sequence. You just run it as it is and whatever you get is whatever you get. Um, but... Uh, the idea, and this also works out of the premise of this is that, remember, case space, the center is contrast and right. the periphery is detail. Details. Okay. So a regular keyhole filling was that that first that first um, that first phase you notice is really long, right? First phase of a twist sequence. Yes. It's like oh yeah, 15, 14, 20, 15, 20, yeah. yeah. Right. So it's filling all of the center of case space. 
and all of the periphery. Okay, and the idea is that after that's finished, on a direct keyhole filling at that point in time, you're basically, it's just a copy paste. All I'm gonna do, because really the patient's body, the patient's, um, their, their, their overall anatomy, that's not changing. The Static. only thing that's changing is the contrast that's flowing in. Right. So all we do is, th this is, this is, this is a regular keyhole. So instead, we just fill the middle and fill the middle. And we have a very, very high temporal resolution, meaning we're getting each one of these. doesn't take me very long to go from one, one 3D to the next. So, but the problem here is that what if the, this is the introduction to a temporal footprint. If the patient screwed the pooch during the pre, if something happened, that means we're copying and pasting crap all over oh. every single one of that periphery. Right. So if that patient had a motion or anything like that, you are going to ruin every single other phase coming after it. So that temporal footprint on a regular keyhole filling, that temporal footprint is, it's really dangerous. For sure. Does that make so sense? How do you know if they screwed the pooch? Your every single phase. So in, in terms of so pooch like screwing, after, right. uh, the, the, if, if every single phase is blurry, every single phase, no matter what, because the contrast looks good, but everything's blurry, right. that would be a, a good indication. Uh, I see, because you don't, it doesn't usually reconstruct until the end, so you won't even know to That's, stop it if they screwed the Well, what can you do anyway? Right, the contrast is going, right? Yeah, yeah so, so, so that is, uh, that's a, a technique, that, you know, just, just for, we continue to go on, right? Right. And, and uh, same thing, this, we're, we're copying and pasting the periphery, and so, this thing has a temporal footprint of however long our, however long our, our sequence went on. A minute and a half is its temporal footprint. Make sense? No, for yeah. sure. Okay, so um, that's where keyhole filling, um, you gotta be really aware of that. Now, uh, typically, uh, there we go. Real quick. Like, yeah, uh, sure. So when you started talking about uh, how many slices you can get or how many seconds between each slice type of thing that's what they're talking about when we're talking temporal resolution right so the temporal resolution inside of temporal resolution can be different things inside of cardiac um it, but in, in in terms of in terms of the the angio sequence uh, it's going to be the time between one phase and the next phase okay one because in those in these twist sequences, you're getting a 3D every six seconds. In that case, right. if it takes me from the start to one, from the start to next, that's my temporal resolution. All right, and you want a high temporal resolution, which means you want as many slices in, or as a little as little seconds in between each phase or whatever as possible because you want to see the maximize like it flow in right you or have to really consider that's an awesome question. You have to consider what the flow rate is at what you are imaging. Imaging. Oh, if point. you've got something that that the, the further away you get from the heart, the slower your flow actually goes. And so you have to. And this is why I would recommend everybody playing around with your temporal resolution to be able to see what is appropriate for different body parts. Right. So but it's an important it's an important question to think about. For I mean, sure. if I if I'm I don't know if if I'm if I am. Um, Doing like lower extremity versus yeah, some something like that. Something. Maybe yeah. I don't need as high because remember, temporal resolution and spatial resolution are usually have an inverse relationship. Right. So as my temporal resolution goes up, meaning the the time between the phases gets smaller, right. the way I get around that is either filling case space in a strange way, or or reducing my overall Encoding. spatial resolution. Right. My voxel size gets larger. Right. And so there's always a mix. For sure. Um, so this is the twist sequence or the tri tricks or whatever, the modified Tree. keyhole. So what we're going to do here, we still do, in this case, on our first, on our first one, we do on our, on our mask or whatever, our pre, we still are going to fill 100% of the outer portion of case space and 100% of the middle of case space. Okay. Okay, inside of your inside of your sequence, it'll tell you uh, A versus B. A is the center of case space. B is the periphery. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do here, um, how you get your temporal resolution low? Let's say I'm going to fill 20% of the 
of my center case space. And you'll notice that your, your periphery of case space has to be divisible by 100. So meaning it can either be 0, 10, 20, 25, 33, or 50. I'll explain this in a bit. <laughs> so so um, I know. Who's excited? <laughs> so, so, so if this is the case, um, I start to run the sequence. And I've already ran my, my pre. This is my pre. OK, so my post, let's say I've selected 20. OK, so that means that I need to fill 20 of the center of case space, 20% of the center. And then I'm going to also fill uh, the first 20% of the periphery. So I've filled the first 20. Make sense yeah. so far? OK. So then here comes my next, my next sequence. And I'm going to fill 20% to the center. And I'm going to fill 20 to the 40th percent of case space here. So 21 to 40 percent. You see? Yes. OK, next one comes along. And I'm going to fill the center again. So I'm still getting really high temporal resolution. But now I'm going to fill another 20% of case space. So now between here, here, and here, I filled 60% of case space. Now remember, I don't get my images until 100% of case space has been filled. Right. So now this next one, I'm filling the center again. And the next quarter, or the next fifth, because remember 20, five times. Right. Do the last one. So in this case, the temporal footprint on here is from here to here. Because if the patient screws up on any of these phases, it's going to make your image blurry. For sure. Meanwhile, if I did the same thing, but I chose 33, that means that I would fill the center and I would fill 33% of case space. Center, the next 33%. And so in this case, my temporal uh, footprint would only be three phases instead of five. So that's the relationship there, because it's obviously going to take a longer time to fill 33% of the periphery than 10 or 20 or whatever. If I, if I hit zero, that's going to take me back to regular keyhole filling. Right. Make sense? For sure. And then this is happening per act, like per slice. Per 3D volume. Per volume. Yeah. So that so, means, is it averaging it out at the end once you get 100% case space? Yeah. It, so, no, it's not averaging it out. It's it's making it to where that would be like if, the, if your patient swallowed halfway through your cervical spine. Right. So we, we're making it to where, in this case, they have five phases to screw it up. In this case, they have three. But uh, okay. the, the, the trade-off here is this takes longer. Like maybe this, maybe this temporal resolution was six seconds. This temporal resolution is eight because it just takes longer to fill more lines of case space. So, so same thing as your, as your, um, as your temporal resolution, uh, worsens, mm -hmm. right? As it gets longer between phases, your temporal footprint lessens. That makes sense. Then, yeah, so fifty percent would be bang half two just twice. They got two tries. You got to screw it. it up. You got it. But it would probably take. Let's just say for argument's sake, we're we're filling. You know, uh, just, just checking in on the news. There, there we go. Uh, I've got fifty percent here, and then the next fifty percent here, but my temporal resolution was higher. Right. And so, and and something also to keep in mind on the on the tricks or twist sequence is that a lot of times um, there's a there's what we're really trying to do is get what's called the time MIP. Mm. You ever seen that? Yeah. Yeah. It's MIP really important. Time, time, yeah. 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 It's it's really important to you can actually have a movie that shows the the filling phase. of every single phase. Right. Because and it's really important that you do that because then you can choose inside that movie. You can choose which one you want to actually MIP. You know what? Uh, so. And I always had a question, and I know this can be vendor specific, but there's been times where I've run a twist or a trick or whatever mm -hmm. and didn't have maybe the Corona or the Sagittal activate it. And I was like, man, I wish there was a way to retroactivate those. Nope. Yeah. You have to manually yep. put them together technically, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and another thing with the twist sequence is that it's 
uh, sometimes either I can change my the amount of my periphery. So this is sorry, this is another thing. Mm -hmm. Let's say I do want to choose 50 percent. The another way that I can make my temporal resolution go down is either by filling less of the center of case space or just reducing spatial resolution as a whole. Ah, uh, right. 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 That and, makes sense. and so and so you've got multiple ways. But in doing so, you're going to make it anytime your voxel is not isotropic. Then your ax, your coronal. If we're acquiring carotids in the coronal or whatever, your coronal will look good. But once you flip it into a sagittal or an axial, you're you lose a significant amount of uh, right. spatial resolution. Because you're in low gain, you that voxel pretty much. Yeah. Right. So so, and that's that's my point. Nice. Um, I'm trying to think. Is there is there any other questions or anything else I can touch on that you are, you know, interested in? Uh, I think you nailed it, man, honestly. I a couple, actually. Uh, I know that at my facility, I don't know if it's just my own experience, but it seems like every place I've worked, dosage for MRAs, for contrast-enhanced MRAs, is not specific to the patient's size. And so it's just like a flat dose, like uh, 10. We give 10 on all MRA carotids. Yep. Well, why is that? Why isn't it? Um, because it's more with some places it's more about a sustained a sustained volume and a sustained right. time of, of filling opacifying uh you know subclavians at the same time as the carotid at the same time as the and that's a volume game that's not necessarily but one of the things about twist and tricks is that you can give a a smaller volume uh, to be able to and, and still capture Right, because if right. my temporal resolution is really small, right. I have a greater chance of getting the entire, the entire um, vessels of interest opacified um, in that smaller amount of time. I suppose it wouldn't be as opacified, but could you also dilute it maybe? Instead of giving 10, give 10 of contrast, diluted with 10 of saline, and then you've now created a I've seen people, window of opportunity. I've seen people do that. Like they'll 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 do the first five with just gadolinium, and they'll do oh. then the, and then they will dilute so that even the push the the saline flush has partial Under, gadolinium inside of it as well. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and so that way you still have a a, a better you still make it work at that point. Right. Um, I mean, and something that twist and tricks and things like that are really good at is those like subclavian steels. Um, anything right. you're not just worried about is the vessel open. You're ver you're also worried about uh, the order in which the, the the blood is actually flowing. Are you seeing oh, you know retrograde sure. flow instead right. of you know it going the opposite way where it's supposed to? Um, sure. AV fistulas. If you ever are looking for, uh, I got one on the schedule when I get home. It's uh, a spine AV fistula, and yeah. it's a really cool way to be able to, the, the trick sequence, a twist sequence is a really great way to be able to see early arterial, mid arterial, and be able to see how it can actually transition into a, a venous malformation. Wow. Can you explain why maybe elliptical case space feeling is the preferred method for MRA enhanced? Yeah, no, I mean, the, because, because when we're filling, when we're filling um, from the middle, out at this point um, it's a lot less it's a lot less dependent on the on the, the patient's individualized cardiac outputs okay because uh, what we're that the middle is the contrast the middle is the contrast That's the contrast That's, That's going to give us our dark and our brightness right yep and so I mean it's I would much rather wait for the contrast to be close to or completely opacified to hit start rather than if right. I'm feeling the other, the old way, to be able to hopefully know that when I'm, when I'm filling the center of case base, <laughs> that the, the carotid is opacified. It's just, it, there's too many variables there. So um, the center of, the 3D centric recording or elliptico-centric case base, it's just, you're taking away more variables specific to a patient. There's, there's also uh, the, the test bolus. That you oh, can do. Yeah, you guys do yeah. that yeah, as we well. Yeah, we do actually do that. Yeah, so you can put an ROI in. You inject what one cc of contrast, right. and you're able to see. But the problem, the problem with that is that um, just super quick mm -hmm. is that you're actually measuring, <coughs> say, you know, signal here, right? Mm -hmm. So this is time, and this is signal. Now the the problem 
uh, in this case, a lot of times you'll see people, they'll go to the peak and then they'll add three seconds or something. Do you guys ever do that? Oh yeah. Uh, we've had, um, you ever seen that? Well, because if I'm doing, this is the peak, offset. this is the peak. If there would be just one CC of contrast, right. if I really gave the true big bolus, big my contrast bolus would be here. And so you can't necessarily, that's not perfectly perfect either because you first, you know, you, you sit there and, and then say, whatever you get here, add X amount of seconds. That's typically a radiologist call, not mine, but two or three seconds. And the idea is you would be hitting. Now, technically too, sometimes these, these, uh, test, these test boluses will have a TTC, like a time to center. And you can still utilize that time when it's the brightest, right? The, if you're not doing it, your mean. Uh, if average. you guys have like a dot engine, like an Angio dot engine, where you can go through and figure out uh, the center of case space aligns with the, the largest, uh, the, the peak of contrast. Right. Kind of t takes a lot of guesswork out of it. Did right. you just answer AI right there? Yeah, he did answer AI, didn't he? <laughs> what? He just AI'd me. He just no. AI'd you. <laughs> no, no, that's not AI. But I mean, oh, there nice. are, that's right. I, I just, I just want to make people aware that if you are using that bolus, the test yeah, bolus, test bolus. There's, that's also not an exact science because uh -huh. we just can't compare apples to oranges when it comes to one cc versus seven or eight or 10 or right. whatever. Sure. Well, I do feel like phase contrast is probably a whole episode on itself, but like, where, how does that play a part? Um, phase contrast is, is a bit bonkers. Um, the idea being how that- How about we just start with 4D flow? Why don't we just- no, I can go forty flow real quick. No. Um, so listen. So the idea. Oh man. Okay. So this this will be thirty thousand feet view, right? All right. If I have a vessel. Okay. If I have a vessel and I have three protons, and they're all going this way, the the blood flow is going. I can't even draw a, an arrow, Matthew. Jeez. Okay, they're so going. Actually, if you collect, they're no, going. They're going this way. <laughs> okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to turn on to be able to, we want to encode this flow. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn on a gradient. And that means that uh, my magnetic field strength is lowest here, low here, nothing at isocenter, a little bit more and a lot more the further and further I get out. So, right. That would mean like here is 1.5 Tesla. Here is one or one point seven Tesla here is 1.3 Tesla. Some I know it's a little math. off subject, but the steeper your ramp up is that is when people get stimulation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, the, the larger difference between when the, cause this is when the, there we go. That's when your, when your gradient's off and you'll notice you're never going to have peripheral nerve stimulation at isocenter cause there's no difference when it's off or on. You're right. going to always have peripheral nerve stimulation 10, uh, 20 to 30 centimeters away from isocenter. So Yo, when you're, me up at first. yeah, when you, but you sit there and you, we always assume all patients are, are making are it up. Making it up. Yeah. So someone's like, I taste quarters in my mouth. <laughs> and I'm like, lady, we're doing a lumbar spine. Get out of here. Uh, good luck with that fibromyalgia. Right. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but really it's true. It's, 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 if you're doing a head, you have a greater chance of, of, back twitching 20, 30 right. um, centimeters away. But anyway, Sorry. okay, so if I've got three, if I've got three, um, three protons here, okay, hold on just a second, boop, there we go. Three protons here and one of them is, we always measure protons moving in centimeters per second, okay? So let's say this proton is moving really fast and during this acquisition, they're gonna actually start here and they're going to end here. Mm -hmm. This proton is moving. Um, doesn't matter. Okay, whatever. Are we still talking Brownian motion? No, I'm sorry. no, no. <laughs> focus. Um, so if, if, if there we go, just don't want to confuse. Okay. So this one's only going to go, which is not really the case. Typically, the the blood that's in the the lumen, the center, it's going to move faster because it's going to have less resistance, resistance on, on the sides. For so whatever. Sure. But let's say this one's only going to go from here to here. So at the end of it, it's only moving this speed. And this one is gonna move this from here to here. Right. Now we know the gradient that we turned on, okay? And so you'll see that this one is going to experience, going from, it's gonna experience this magnetic field strength all the way up to 
Really? You see what I mean? This magnetic field strength. Ah, uh, yeah. So that means that on, you know, it around the clock face, it's moving really, really fast. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And so let's say if there was stationary tissue and it's out here, there's a proton out here that's stationary tissue. It's going to continue. It's going to see this magnetic field strength and nothing else. It's not moving. Right. So it's going to stay moving the same speed as itself. So it will have, so if we make a clock face, it will have no phase shift. It never got, it, it's, it's exactly where it's supposed to be around the clock face. Whereas this guy uh, starting out from here, oh, sorry, this guy starting out from here and going all the way over here, he has seen, or she, has seen a very, very large change in the magnetic field strength because they're moving so fast. So they are further along. They're like, they're pointing over here. Hey, this is like time travel. Do you see? It actually is time travel. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Uh, how far you travel over time. <laughs> so so we're, we're, th this, this guy right here, this one right here, is, is, is only going to go a very small distance. So it's only experienced a very small change in the magnetic field strength. So it's only slightly ahead of the one that was holding still. Nice. Whereas this one's somewhere in between. So now what we can do here in phase, in phase direction, we can sit there and we say anything at zero is we're going to give a gray, a, a gray pixel to anything that's moved really far, oh, right. uh, you know, far ahead. We're going to give it a, a bright or a dark pixel. So let's say, for instance, uh, I've just decided anything that gets faster, I'm going to give a bright pixel. So okay. see, this would be gray. This one would be bright gray. This one would be, you know, Pretty, pretty, pretty bright. decently bright. And this one would be bright, bright. You see what I mean? Yeah. So now we can be able to see inside of a vessel and the vessel will be bright based off of its phase. based off of the phase. But what we have to do is we have to determine what is this 180. And that's called oh. the VINC. Okay. Velocity encoding. So we're turning, we're basically, the VINC is going to be how steep that this gradient is going to be applied. Right. Okay, and the whole point of it is to be able to see, like, if, if my, if my, if I have really, really slow flow, you guys, mm -hmm. I need, if um, it's only going to go from here to here, the only way to really separate, um, you know, this really slow flow is if I jack this vink up oh, big time. Right. So now, even something going from here to here has experienced a gigantic change in the magnetic field strength. So they have a large phase shift. I see. See what I'm saying? Right. And so, that's when you're gonna get that so, stimulation more. Huh? Oh, hell yes. Yeah. And, and and you'll notice the, um, the the times where you have, you're putting the most pressure on your gradients are diffusion sequences oh, and yeah. CSF flow studies. Yep. And anytime I'm doing a phase contrast uh, with slow flow like Venus. Yep. Oh yeah, some cardiac sequences. Cardiac sequences, you're, you're, the, the higher the number, of the vink, let's say you're, I, I'm doing the aorta, so I right. want to do 150 centimeters per second. That's, that's actually, well, it's ramp up, right? It's like it, it's, uh, exactly. It's like not very much at all because everything's going so fast. It's gonna. It, I don't have to have a, a gigantic ramp up. I see. Okay. So the idea here is that uh, if we go back and just kind of yeah, making this thing a little less messy. If I did the exact you're, same thing. You're really thing. getting good at this. Thank you so much. Um, so let's do the opposite way. So now I've got three protons and they're moving this way. So they, and, and that's what's so cool about the phase contrast technique right. is that you can actually tell the direction of the flow. But that's if we're being, you, you'll notice in your phase contrast technique, you have, I, I've got my magnitude images. I have oh, my uh, rephased images. Yeah. I have my phase images. Right. Right. magnitude image is just going to be anything that's moving fast is bright. doesn't matter what direction it is. Right. So uh, whereas phase is going to take in the direction. So same thing. These guys right here, they're going, this one's going to go all the way down. This one's going to go a short distance. This one's going to go medium range. So they actually start out spinning much faster, right? They're, right? they're seeing a much higher magnetic field strength. So they, in relationship to this proton that's doing nothing, they're going to spin slower. So this guy right here that had a very, he, there was a, a very large difference between the magnetic field strength here and here. 
they they're going to have a, a, they're going to be much slower. They're not going to be nearly as far around the clock face. This one right here is going to be somewhere around here. And so in this case, GE and Siemens both do it opposite. Oh, of course. And right. so um, um, so it's like in, window in, leveling. In this case, this is bright. In this case, this is dark. Right. Um, and so you'll see on a phase contrast image, you will have, uh, in this case, if I'm think about my aorta, if I have my aorta and I was looking at this and I was, uh, I turned on my vink to be head to foot. Let's say this one's going up. So this is going to be bright and this one's coming down and it's going to be dark, right? Because in this case, oh, yeah. so if I have a, so you see what I mean? If yeah. it's going up, it's getting, it's getting a positive phase shift. Then you're actually going to see a signal drop off because it's not going head to foot. Right. It's going A to P. So you'll see it drop off here. What we do instead is we say, I don't care about the phase information now. Just give me the magnitude image. Okay. You know what I mean? So just give me bright, bright, bright. Right, right. And so what you can do, and that's what we do in MRVs, and I challenge everybody to do a phase contrast MRV. It's really good. Right. So you can sit there and you can say, I want to be sensitive. So, right, I'm going to have my my superior sagittal sinus, transverse sinuses coming down to the jugulars. I am going to do one of these to go from um, A to P, one of them to go from head to foot, and one of them to go from right to left. And then I'm going to summarize, I'm going to sum them all together. We call it the magnitude sum. Uh -huh. And so now you're sensitive to flow going A to P, you're sensitive to flow going right to left, and you're sensitive to flow going head to foot. Put them all together and you've got yourself bright images that have, you're not worried about that in-plane saturation that you get, that you get on your MRVs. Right. I was, I was in, um, I was doing apps in Jamaica a couple of weeks ago. And Where's my invite, bro? I, I meant to, but then I, again, went on living my life. Um, but, um, uh, but we tried this and it worked out really, really well. Non-contrast. It was right. really cool. Nice. Um, but so in this case, phase contrast wise, you don't have to worry about that 15 degree angle because of the technique. But what you do have to, and this is just a mess. Sorry. Um, um, what you do have to think about is making sure your vink is appropriate. Mm -hmm. Ideally, your vink needs to be just higher than uh, the the maximum flow. So can you can you have multiple vinks for each direction? You can. Right. Yeah, totally. It's called free mode. You can go through and say left to right. I want the vink to be thirty centimeters per second. Nice. Um, that kind of thing. But ideally, for for it, um, your CSF flow studies, you want to be between. If you're doing phase contrast, you want to be between probably five and eight centimeters per second. Because any higher than that, you get wrap. Oh, so, so exactly. So in our clock face, what happens is if I've chosen a 180 degree vink, or, uh, no, if I've chosen a seven centimeters per second vink, and really inside this vessel, I'm going eight centimeters per second. So what it does, the, the, the computer gets confused and it flips to where it flips, you know, if this would be four, this would be five, this would be six, this would be seven, this would be eight. So it gives it a, a black voxel when it should have given it a bright, a, a white voxel and vice versa. Right. So you actually, you'll see like an image, your aorta and everything is completely black. And then right during, typically thir during like systole, when it's pumping, the, the, you'll all just have a voxel that is just white instead. And that's aliasing. Bang. Okay. Is, you, okay. Is there a way to determine the optimal vink prior to the exam? No. Like a scout? I mean, you, there, there are something? values, um, you know, uh, in the in the heart. If I'm doing the aorta and the patient is not stenotic, then my vink is typically I'm going to start out. There's like vink scouts that you can use as well mm -hmm. to where you can sit there and say, okay, I'm going to do a 9 and a 10 and a 12, and I'm going to see which one uh, has the brightest blood without aliasing inside of it. Um, now, if you have uh, a stenotic valve or anything like that, all bets are off. Oh, because okay. it's like you putting your your thumb over a water hose. Your right. your vink could easily be five hundred centimeters per second. And oh, so, so everything's going to alias at that point. 
Well, what can you do about that? You're going to take your vink to 500, 500 centimeters per second, and you're going to you're going to be able to because that's the only way. If you have a, an accurate vink, that's the only way that you can actually quantify how fast that flow is. That flow, and that's right? the thing in yeah. phase contrast um, outside the brain is that you can actually go through, um, you know, and, and even CSF flow studies. We're trying to measure not only the direction of the flow, but also how fast it's moving. I think people don't earn this. I don't think people, well, I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm generalizing, but I think there is a big deal between visualization and quantification in MRI. And it's, it, mm-hmm. it gets kind of, I don't know, uh, overlooked, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, for sure. Because there's only a handful of techniques that we can use to actually quantify what we're doing. Most of what we're doing is visualization for the radiologist. Right? Well, with AI. We'll be able to. <laughs> um, no, uh, you're right. You're right. right. I mean, now the phase contrast technique has about a 6% um, error rate just because of the of the of the technique right so uh, that's a whole nother that's like a For three sure. day thing well it sounds like six percent sounds good to me yeah no but right? but but try try that phased contrast technique in the MRV uh, and fa- do um because uh, we're looking at vessels so the vessel or the vein has not anywhere close to the vink that the artery has right it's not going nearly as fast so do like a do like a 10 or like a 12, something like that. Right. What you really want is bright vessels. You don't want grays right. because grays in this case mean that your vink was much too high. Right. And I might be uh, kind of in coaching on uh, CSF flow studies a little bit, but uh, when we are quantifying, you want to make sure you're going through plane, right? Yeah. The only way that we can quantify um, really if we're going for quantification right. is have through plane flow. And so what's the purpose of in plane? Imaging. In plane flow is typically for like visualization of, of just is something open or closed. Right. Like typically, if you're doing a CSF flow study, you're primarily concerned either about like a Chiari that's getting in the way of of CSF moving um, through the brain, right. or uh, the sil- the um, aqueduct of Sylvius. Yeah. So make sure that's opened and patent. Um, and good old homie aqueduct of Sylvius. Yeah, but uh, that's typically what you're doing CSF flow study for. Right. Uh, or in the spine, if again, if you have a syrinx, you're trying to see where the flow is going at that point. Oh, I bet that looks um, interesting. Yeah, and for anybody at home that doesn't know the difference, uh, through plane versus in plane flow, because we talked about it, it really depends on the flow of the of the blood in regard to the slice. So if the blood is going through, it's perpendicular. If it's yeah, if it's perpendicular to the slice, that is through plane flow. However, if I was doing like a sagittal candy cane here, you'll see that now that flow is parallel to the slice. Right. So that is that is in plane flow. So just yeah, that just so you know. So I, actually, a handy thing that I've recently learned is because the majority of my phase contrast experiences with cardiac imaging, and so mm-hmm. I find actually that typically with a patient who's having an MRI of their heart, they've already had an echo stress. And on those echo reports mm-hmm. is where you can find the optimal bank. Yeah, and, and the echo reports are in oh, oh, uh, think about that. It is in meters per second, oh, you gotta typically. Convert. And so you got to convert a little yeah. bit, but that, right. yeah, exactly. In cardiac, that's that's a that's a really good cheat code if you're looking for because typically a patient would have had an echo. It's easier, right? Um, and but yeah, you but you just have to convert um, meters per second to right. centimeters per second. And that's King a, Henry died while drinking chocolate milk. What are you talking Say it again? about? King Henry died while drinking chocolate milk. The metric system? That's how I'm, you remember? I'm, a, I'm an American, Reggie. I don't know what the metric <laughs> system is. These colors don't run, there's, and these colors don't do the metric system. There's some radiographers out there who's bobbing with me. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Um, you know, one thing I think maybe we probably should have covered it sooner before we got into phase contrast is what you know you get a lot a lot of techs who patient squeezes the ball right at the time of injection and so now your your bolus is compromised is there a fix for that or is there a little trick that you can do is there alternatives to run yeah um S- spell I, the paper and be like oh man i always do i always do uh, in siemens i would always do a vibe sequence uh, a pre and post vibe with no, a subtraction no like if or? i've lost if i've lost my my bolus for some reason so two, two things you really want to do with contrast enhanced angiography. Mm-hmm. You, do not, you do not want to, uh, with your care bolus, your care bolus or your, your, your um, fluoro trigger has to be in the same table position the, 
for, as the pre. Right. Because typically you're always going to have, you're going to have your pre, you're going to have your post, and you're going to have your visualization. Uh, so care bolus, uh, floral trigger, care trigger. See what I did? Care trigger. So, so at that point, you want to make sure that this is always copied to the table position. Because if it's not, uh -huh. if you've moved it too far up or down, then you're going to see the contrast come in. You're going to hit go, and then the then the, the magnet's going to have to do a pre scan, and it's and you're going, ah! the contrast is like bye. Yeah, <laughs> and and it's it it's gone, right? It's like yeah, it's gone. Yeah. So so at that point, uh, I would recommend doing a gradient echo sequence with a really short TR and a really short TE. So at GE, you could do like the lava sequence, um, oh, yeah. um, Siemens, the, the vibe sequence, and the vessels, I would wait a little bit for the contrast to get mixed to where you kind of reach closer to an equilibrium. Oh, so the contrast is not just tissue. arterial, not just venous, it right. just kind of is like spread out. Um, and when you do that, I would do triplane, um, I would do a triplane vibe sequence um, coronal axial transversal and and then the um, you'll be able to go through and see the vessel as being bright at that nice. point that's always my my go-to helps to prevent a callback right yeah right yeah um, and you're not mipping these but you're just looking at the vessel as you scroll through those slices yeah right exactly because nice. uh, remember the vibes and the lavas they have they say there's a three millimeter slice thickness but they're really a six Oh. And so you throw those bad boys into a uh, into NPR or, or MIP, and they're going to look Just atrocious. Like, yeah. Uh, but if you get all three of them, you have that in-plane uh, resolution that you can watch in all three planes. Nice. Yep. Nice. Something else, uh, you could do a true FISP sequence, a oh, true FISP yeah. or, a, or a Fiesta sequence to get bright blood as well in the aorta. Right. You could be able to do a, like a gated true FISP or, or Fiesta sequence. Um now, is there an option to just to do this to avoid contrast to begin with? Yeah, so there's there's um, there's a couple of techniques. Typically, they're all based off the SSFP sequence. The SSFP sequence is the only sequence, at, no matter where it is in the body, it's going to result in bright fluid. And right. so Siemens calls it true FISP. Uh, um, GE calls it, like I said, Fiesta. And so uh, okay. there are there are techniques that involve an SSFP readout and some sort of either, either there's there's non-contrast renals, for instance, and you're trying to, there's inferior sat bands that are trying to get the venous signal from not showing up and you're waiting, it's like a time of flight, but with a readout of, of the SSFP sequence. So a lot of, and I gotta hand it to like Toshiba and Hitachi on that one because in the, in the, in, in the Asian market, they don't give a lot of contrast. And oh. so those vendors are very far ahead when it comes to non-contrast um, uh, NGO techniques. Yeah. Uh, but it's always centered around either the, the non-contrast is always centered around some sort of gating, some sort of saturation of background tissue, back, uh, uh, venous or whatever, and mm -hmm. then a readout of the SSFP sequence. Nice. So, yeah. Nice. Now, I know this isn't necessarily angiography, but I know vessel wall has been a big thing, and it's almost like the complete opposite, right? Where we want the vessels to be dark, right? I mean, yes. So, so typically, um, so you're talking like incorporating a dark blood sequence, like right. a dark blood. Because we're usually looking at like maybe plaques or things like that. Now, a lot of RADs will tell you, will tell you that in, um, got to wrap it up soon, I know. No, but, no. You sure? She's asking him how much more I want on my oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, A lot of RADs will tell you that you really can't visualize the vessel wall nearly as good um, oh, CT. Oh, because of resolution. partial voluming. Oh, yeah, so, I didn't so, think about that. So think about if I'm looking straight down. Top down. Which I'm top down. <laughs> if, I, if I'm doing, if I'm doing, um, if I'm doing my vessel wall, really to be able to see my vessel wall, which is very, very thin, I would need really, really tiny voxels. Right, right. But um, that's that's why. And whenever you have two tissues in the same voxel, it's going to average out. That's right? right, partial voluming. And so let's just say we're doing the super macro, and this is what we've got. You know, uh, and this also goes into flow quantification as well, right? Because right. I can I can trust that this vo this this voxel is all blood. 
but this voxel here is half and half. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, and so you would get, let's say you add, you actually had a seven centimeters per second vink here and you had nothing here, it would average out to tell you that you had a 3.5 centimeter per second vink. So you can't really trust those values. Same reason, if we're looking at a vessel wall, we would need something. And that's that's also, I'm not a radiologist, you guys. There right. is probably a radiologist out there that is fine with this. Right. Um, but, and then, yeah, that's definitely not my scope, but I'm just telling you that's the reason why people say it's, it's they don't recommend MRI. looking into MRI for, yes, please. That's right. One of the, uh, the only time. Katie, you're the best. Only, only time that we are kind of uh, using vessel wall MR mm -hmm. is for hemorrhagic plaques, right? Just because CT struggles with that. Sure. Um, so there's been a benefit that we've seen in our practice with it. Um, yeah, but you're using dark blood. But we're using point. dark blood, so exactly. That's, so dark blood is typically high resolution turbo spin echo sequencing. Right. With the same thing we're using in morphology in the heart. Right. So we're using an additional inversion to be able to make the blood, yeah. no matter what, be super dark against the, the vessel wall. Thank you. Contrast, right? Yeah. For sure. Um, yeah, what's well, been nice is, uh, of course, 3D imaging, right? So cubes and things like that, uh, their techniques, of course, because they're fast spin echoes, mm -hmm. uh, based off fast spin echo sequence. So, oh, yeah. Um, That's a really cool physics behind that is oh, right? really rad. Yeah, we're actually trying to get that uh, one of the creators of the cube on the podcast. Yeah, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, Dr. Howard Raleigh. Yeah. Cool. Shout out. But uh, yo, honestly, anybody who enjoys the way Matt teaches, like we do, we get a lot of positive feedback whenever. Oh we're my here. gosh, go check out Imaging You. He has courses on everything. We'll put a link down in the description. Uh, but it's 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 so much value in that, and of course, everyone loves his drawings, and he has so <laughs> so many you know animations. Like he really does a great job with Imaging You. So you guys definitely check that out. There's a lot of benefit there. Thanks, guys. For sure. Well, and you're yeah, not just down. education. I mean, you're a fun educator. So right. uh, you're I'm, easy I'm to not, listen to. I'm not just an. I'm not a normal dad. I'm a cool dad. Yeah, right? I'd say that I mean, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, let's not get crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that was a, a Mean Girls reference. Sorry, my uh, kids have me watching. Gotta oh, okay. say, I haven't seen that. <laughs> um, uh, it's on Katie, Netflix. I don't know. Is there anything that you feel like we haven't covered yet? No, I think this is awesome. Thank you, Matt. You're awesome. Uh, You're yes. welcome. Thanks for having Thank me, guys. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, poor judges of character keep having me out here, but I'll, I'm here for they it. They keep calling for yes. you, man. Yeah. They, they, they want more. They people want, more. want it. We you realize that's my grandmother and aunts and uncles. That <laughs> that's why it's the same three that. people. Yeah. 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 Right. I kind of noticed they all had the same last name, but I was they, thinking. Yeah. <laughs> it's how many, how, many, how many Gmail accounts they're willing to. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they keep CCing you on these things. Right. <laughs> well, thank you for all the subscriptions. Then. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. No, but truly, thank you, though. Yes. Uh, we appreciate your time. We appreciate you. Um, I guess, Reggie? Yeah, the knowledge, yeah. Uh, big shout out to our sponsors. Uh, big shout out to all our subscribers, all our supporters, everybody out there that continues to watch week after week. Uh, we we uh, enjoy doing this, so and we need the support to do it, so we appreciate the support that we're getting. So thank you guys so much for that. And if you see us out and about because we're at these conferences and stuff, come say hi to us. We always appreciate that. We've yeah. had a few people recently, so hi to you. Robert actually cried. I did a couple times. I'll tell people that. <laughs> and he brought a Sharpie with him everywhere he went, <laughs> signing autographs. <laughs> had headshots with me. Uh, no, but truly, uh, we appreciate you. Uh, hit subscribe. Tell your friends about us. Do all those things that YouTubers tell you to do. Make friends in the comments, those sort of things. Uh, I guess Zone 3 podcast. We are out. Good. <laughs>